Okay, so let us begin. We begin with um, three times the homage to the Buddha. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Okay, so we are continuing now with our reading of the Anguttara Nikaya, Book of the Fours. And now we come to Sutta number 35. This is called Vasakara Sutta. And Vasakara was the chief minister of the state of Magadha. So he was like the prime minister to King um, Ajatasattu. Ajatasattu was the king of Magadha, and Ajatasattu got to be the king by assassinating his own father. His own father, King Bimbisara, was a very devout supporter of the Buddha. But Devadatta, the Buddha's cousin, had the ambition to become the head of the Sangha, to depose the Buddha and to take over the Sangha. And so Devadatta came to visit Ajatasattu when he was a prince, and he convinced Ajatasattu to kill his father, first to imprison his father, then to try to starve him to death. And then when his father would not starve to death, then he used more forceful means to kill his father. And the idea was that Ajatasattu would, uh, Devadatta would get Ajatasattu to become the king, and then as king, Ajatasattu would throw his support behind Devadatta to replace the Buddha as the head of the Sangha. This didn't work out because Devadatta's plans to depose the Buddha all failed. And so eventually Devadatta died. But Ajatasattu continued to be the king of Magadha. And his chief minister is named Vasakara. Okay, so now in the sutta, Vasakara comes to the Buddha and he opens a discussion about what are the qualities that make one a great man with great wisdom. So I think this is something that we all aspire to be, a great person with great wisdom. And so Vasakara has certain criteria in mind, which we could say of the world criteria for considering somebody a great person in mundane or worldly terms. So the first of these is that he is highly learned in various fields of learning. So in India, in the ancient times, there were several fields of learning and to be considered a true erudite person, a true pandita, you had to be skilled in these fields of learning. These included grammar, one's supposed to know grammar, logic, the rules of reasoning. One should know something about medicine. And one should know astrology, be able to determine the course of events through knowledge of the positions of the stars. Okay, so that is the mark of learning. Then one has to be have an astute mind and being able to interpret the meaning of statements. Then one should have a good memory. I can hear you. Can't hear me? We can, Bante, we can. You can hear me. Okay. Yes. 
I heard somebody say, I can't hear you. Okay, as long as you can. Okay, so one is, has a good memory. And then the fourth, of course, is especially relevant to the householder life. One is skillful and diligent and attending to the various chores of a householder. And you have to have sound judgment in knowing how to carry them out skillfully, properly. Of course, when we look at these four criterion, from my own point of view, I would not say that somebody who possesses these four qualities would thereby become a great person of great wisdom. I think even in mundane terms, one would have to say that somebody should have other qualities to be a great person of great wisdom. Okay, so these are the criteria that Vasakara comes up with. And then he asks the Buddha what he thinks of his understanding, whether the Buddha will approve of it or will criticize it. And the Buddha is very skillful. So as often as the case, as is often the case, he doesn't directly say, I approve or I disapprove, but rather he sort of skirts taking a definitive stand in regard to the statement of the Brahmin. And instead, he proposes four other qualities that make one a great person of great wisdom. So the first of these is that one is practicing for the welfare and happiness of many people. So you can say that this shows the altruistic dimension of being a great person. And then this is elaborated. What does it mean by practicing for the welfare and happiness of many people? that one establishes many people in what is called the noble method. The technical term for this is Arya Nyaya. Bhante, we can't see your face. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm trying to get some text from the Pali in order to create a new file so that everybody can see the words. You'll, see, you'll, you'll get to see me again in a moment. Do you see the word file that I'm just creating? Yes, Bhante. Okay. Okay, so the key word here is Arya Nyaya. And this is taken to be a synonym for the Noble Eightfold Path. So there are some suttas that identify that Arya Nyaya with the Noble Eightfold Path. What, is there an English translation? The English translation is the Noble Method. Yeah, the noble method. And then further, he is what's, I think what's intended as a gloss or a definition of the noble method is what comes next, the goodness of the Dhamma, the wholesomeness of the Dhamma. And so the Pali says that one establishes Kalyana Dhammata, so kalyana means good, and of course, dhammata is the dharma, and kusala dhammata. So one establishes people in what is good and what is wholesome. Uh, 
Okay, the second criterion of the good person, or of the wise person, the great man, the great person with great wisdom, he thinks whatever thoughts he wants to think and does not think what he does not want to think. He intends whatever he wants to attend and does not intend what he does not want to intend. And thus he has, maybe this is the best way to express it, attained to meant to mastery, mastery of mind, mastery over the ways of thought. Yeah, so in our own case, the case of us, we are ordinary people. So our minds get over, overpowered by many thoughts that we don't want to think. For example, just when we were sitting in meditation just a little while ago, how many people were able to keep the mind entirely on the body and on the breath without the mind wandering away from the breath to other types of thought. Could anybody achieve that? If anybody could achieve that, you could speak up. For short moments. For moments, yeah, but continuously for a half an hour. Very hard. Very, very hard, yeah. Okay, so this is the, you would say, this is the process of training in practice, the practice of Buddhism, the training of the mind is that we can overcome the unwholesome thoughts, the undesirable thoughts, and then direct our mind to think any thoughts that we want to think. And the way to overcome the unwholesome thoughts, especially, there are actually two main methods. One main method is simply to observe whatever thought arises, briefly note the thought, then let the thought go and bring the mind back to a primary object. In this case, observing the body. So as we sit in the sitting posture, we just focus the mind on the felt sense of the body, sitting, 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 or body, body, body. Then the thought comes, oh, tomorrow I have a free day. What am I going to do tomorrow? Or <laughs> yesterday he said something nasty to me. How am I going to get revenge on him? Or I'm getting tired of staying in the monastery all the time. I want to go out and enjoy myself. So these thoughts come up. So when they come up, just as soon as possible, we note them, identify them, let them go, and then come back to the felt sense of the body, sitting, 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 or body, 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 or in-breath, out-breath, in-breath, out-breath. And that way, gradually, and it's a long, drawn-out, gradual process, gradually, the thoughts start to lose their power. So, you know, initially when we start meditation, when we're beginners, the mind gets overrun again and again by all of these disturbing and distracting thoughts. But when we practice over time, you say over months and over years, the mind becomes tamer and tamer. Like a, first we have a wild horse, twists and turns and runs here and there. But if we just leave the horse in the pasture, penned in in a certain area, over time it settles down and it loses its wildness. So in that same way, the mind gradually settles and becomes more and more tame. Of course, those thoughts, distracting thoughts arise, but when they arise, they don't have that force, that ferocity, that persistence that they do in the early stage. But they'll arise and then we notice them and then they break up like, like bubbles, just like bubbles coming to the surface of the water. The bubble bursts and then there's nothing left to the bubble. 
So that's one method is just noting the thought, not giving special attention to the thought, but just identifying the thought, or more broadly, just noting the mind is wandering, the mind is thinking, and let the thought go and come back to the primary object. So that's one method. The other method of taming the thought process is by developing deliberately and specifically a meditation subject that is directly opposed to the undesirable type of, of thinking. And so according to the suttas, the methods that, that, that recommended in the suttas, there are specific meditation subjects which the Buddha prescribes like medicine for particular illnesses. And so it's said for the, for the thoughts of sensual lust, sensual desire, the effective remedy is the calling to mind the parts of the body, the meditation on the unattractive nature of the body. So somebody, maybe a man, is filled with lustful thoughts of the beautiful women, but then he takes, starting with his own body, and then starts examining what does this body consist of? And then one starts to see there's hairs of the head, whiskers, the fingernails, teeth, skin, and you remove the skin and you come inside and there's muscles, sinews, bones, the marrow of the bones, the various internal organs, the fluids. And so the body that seems so attractive on the outside, when you probe into it analytically, you see that there's nothing very beautiful and attractive in the body. So we have the it's called the Asuba Bhavana, the, or the Asuba Sanya, the idea of the unattractive nature of the body as the medicine for sensual craving. Then for ill will, resentment, hatred, there's the meditation on loving kindness, generating the wish, the desire for the well-being and happiness of all living beings. And then what I found to be effective for laziness and negligence and heedlessness is the recollection of death, bringing to mind the fact that death will take place and we never know when we're going to die. Okay, so there are various, and then for sometimes when we're feeling down, downcast, dejected, sad, anxious, worried. What I find to be effective is the recollection of the qualities of the Buddha, bringing to mind the beautiful, wonderful qualities of the Buddha and even the image of the Buddha. And then that fills the mind with joy and with, confid with confidence, with enthusiasm, and that dispels the feelings of sadness, dejection, worry, anxiety, and inspires, gives the mind some inspiration to continue with the practice. Okay, and so from time to time, one could use these specific meditation subjects to overcome the particular types of, types of undesirable thoughts that arise. And as one practices, again, over a long period of time, one gets the ability to think whatever one wants to think, to choose whatever one wants to choose. And so gradually, one gains mastery over the ways of thought. Just want to get the Pali expression for this.
Yeah, the Pali term here is ceto vasi patto. So ceto is mind, vasi is mastery, and patto is attained, achieved. So one achieves mastery over the mind in the expression here is interesting, vitaka pate. So pate, it's just like the English word path, a path of vitaka, vitaka are thoughts. And so this is an ideal to set for ourselves, even if it's a distant ideal, but through training the mind, we can gain this ability to master our thoughts so that we don't get overrun by emotions, unwholesome emotions, or by wild, anxious, distracted thoughts, but we can gain control over the mind. And they, we can direct the mind in any direction we want. And I'm speaking a bit idealistically here, so don't think that I have this mastery over the ways of thought. <laughs> but this is the ideal that we're aiming at, the goal that we're aiming at, through this gradual training. Okay, then the third quality of the great person, according to the Buddha, is to gain easily, without any difficulty, the four jhanas that constitute the higher mind. We don't have to go into the four jhanas now because we'll, we're going to come across them again and again in the Anguttara Nikaya. But these are the four stages of meditative absorption, the four stages of deepening sam samadhi, the unification of the mind and its absorption into its object. So this, the attainment of the four jhanas represents the mastery of samatha, of tranquility meditation or the mastery of samadhi. And then the fourth quality of the great person of great wisdom, and this is the true sort of culmination of the training and panya of wisdom, is achieving the dis first the destruction of the asavas, of the taints, and then realizing in this very life the taintless liberation of mind, liberation by wisdom. So following the mastery over the jhanas, the practitioner has to go further. The practitioner has to go further and to develop vipassana or panya, wisdom. And so as that wisdom goes deeper and deeper and becomes sharper and sharper, it starts to attenuate, to weaken the defilements until it starts cutting through one layer of defilements after another, marking the first three stages of realization, the stage of stream entry, once returning, non-returning. And then when the wisdom reaches its culmination, then it cuts off finally and ultimately what are here called or translated as the taints, but the Pali word is asava. And what are the asavas? Anybody remember? Bhante Kamasava, Bhavasava, and Richasava. Right, very good. Okay, so we have three asavas mentioned in the suttas Kamasava, Bhavasava and avijasava. 
So first, the, the word asava itself, the word common to these things, it's based on the root, well, the root is su, which means to flow. And from this, we get the verb savati, to flow. And then the prefix a ah gives the direction. So some commentators say the direction is outward. So they sometimes we have a translation of asava as outflows. Some say the direction of the flow is inward. So then we have inflows or influx, influxes or even influences. Because if you look at the word influence, the ordinary English word, we have the prefix in, and then flu, the fluence comes from the word, the verb to flow. Like if somebody is fluent in a language, it means that they can speak that language just continuously, just the way water flows. Okay, so we have inflows or outflows, but here in the Ankutara Nikaya, I was actually following Venerable Jnana Moli in his translation of the Majjhima Nikaya. He used the word taint, which I didn't really like, but I just kept it to be consistent with the translation of the Majjhima Nikaya. And so we have these three asavas, these outflows, inflows, or taints. One is kamasava, which is sensual craving. The second is bhavasava, which is the craving for continued existence, the craving for renewed existence. And the third is the avijasava, the outflow or inflow of ignorance. And so those are, I call them, describe them as the most primordial level of the defilements, which is why they persist in some form or another all the ways up to our hardship. And so the attainment of our hardship is described as the unasava, that means without any outflows or without any inflows, taintless, ceto vimuti. That's liberation of mind. And panya vimuti, liberation by wisdom. And so it's said in the commentaries that ceto vimuti expresses the samadhi aspect of the attainment of our hardship, the fruit of our hardship. And the panyavimuti expresses the wisdom aspect. So when the arhat attains the fruition of our hardship, it's a special meditative absorption available only to the arhat, in which the arhat will experience, in this life itself, will experience the bliss of Nibbana. And in that absorption, in the fruit of arhatship, there is samadhi, which is the ceto vimuti, and there is the panya, or wisdom, which is panyavimuti. And these two are united inseparably in the fruit of our hardship, the attainment of our hardship. Okay, so the Buddha says that, sort of summing up, he says that from his perspective, these are the four qualities or characteristics of a great person of great wisdom. And if we look at these four characteristics, what we could say is that the 
factors two, three, and four are factors that will be common to all arhats. All arhats have this mastery over the ways of thought. Well, actually, not all arhats attain the four jhanas, but most arhats can attain the four jhanas, and all arhats will have this liberation of mind, liberation by wisdom. And so what sets the Buddha off and puts him in a unique class of his own is that he is the one who's practicing for the welfare and happiness of many people and establishes many people in the noble method, in the goodness and wholesomeness of the Dhamma. Actually, many arhats are also practicing in this way but the Buddha is, you could say, the pioneer in this development. So the Buddha is the one who opens up the gates to the path. And then the Arhat disciples following the Buddha, basing themselves on the Buddha's teaching, can establish many people in the goodness of the Dhamma, in the wholesomeness of the Dhamma. Like, for example, Sariputta, Moggallana, Ananda, Mahakashyapa also had many disciples of their own that they establish in the noble method, but they do so relying on the teaching that they learned and mastered through the guidance of the Buddha. Okay, so when the Buddha gives this description, <laughs> then the Brahman Vasakara says, first he applauds the statement, he says it's wonderful, it's amazing how this has been well stated by Master Gotama. And then he says, we consider Master Gotama to be one who possesses these four qualities. And then he repeats, the four qualities. Then the Buddha says something that I found a little bit strange. He says, surely, Brahman, your words are prying and intrusive. And the Pali words that are used here are actually stronger. I translated them a little weakly in English. Let me get the exact Pali words. Okay, so vacha are words, and basita means spoken. So the word spoken, and then it's said to be asaja upaniya. Now the word, the word asaja comes from a verb as, asadeti, which one of the nuances of this word is to attack or to offend. And upaniya means coming close sort of coming close in an aggressive way. And so it's almost, if you translate these words very literally, it's almost like your words are insulting and aggressive. Though I find it puzzling, why, why should the Buddha say that these words, which seem to be praising him, are insulting and aggressive? Anybody have any ideas about this? Perhaps there's something in Indian culture which doesn't quite correspond to my background as, as an American. Any ideas? You can unmute could, if you want to speak. Could, could it because um, 
that they think this is such a high ground that no one else can uh, can achieve, uh, which is lose the the uh, encouragement or the the teaching from Buddha that was trying to get everybody to strive to do this, but uh, their answer was only Buddha can can be like that. Is that, is that possible? So that Buddha uh, was trying to um, discourage that kind of thought. That, that's my. <laughs> yeah, I don't quite see it that way. So I don't have a fixed idea about the reason. Uh, he, excuse me? He yeah. says, he starts off by saying, your words are prying and intrusive. Yeah. It's not a positive way of saying something. So maybe he found the, the, the words, the, what was said to him to be um, kind of, you know how something you, sometimes someone says something to you, and it's a good question, but it's said in a way that's uh, with has has four meaning, four reason for saying it, almost like a stab. Okay, almost you, like a stab. Yeah, but you go ahead and you answer it politely, which is what he he does. He does answer it politely. You know, he answers the guy when he's you know he he. he he comments on his the way he says it. Like, yeah, it could have been the tone with which he said it. Perhaps there was something of a sarcastic tone in the statement. But he still is he still is uh, intent on being kind and gentle to the man. So he gives this explanation. Yeah. Yeah, Bhante, he does. Yeah. Bhante, perhaps uh, Buddha was trying to stop this man from being a flatterer. Yes. Um, <laughs> perhaps. Perhaps. Okay, th there are various possibilities. I, I don't really have a definite answer. But um, we could think about this. Okay, so the Buddha, he starts off by saying, your words are prying and intrusive, or probably more literally, your words are a bit insulting and aggressive. But then the Buddha answers, and then he says yes, and then he affirms each of that he has each of these qualities. Well, it's not, it's, Buddha would not respond angrily to the man. Oh, of course, the Buddha never responds angrily. Not, yeah, so he, he gives, you know, you can look at it also that even though the man is speaking like this, maybe he really does need the information, so give it to him. Why not give it to him? So he yeah. gives Yeah. One thing, yeah. this, uh, this man, uh, Vasakara, if you can recall, he actually appeared at the first setting where the Buddha, during the Parinibbana Sutta, so he went, to see, he went to see Buddha and he said that, look, Buddha, um, Ajata Satu asked me to come here to pay my homage to you and that we want to conquer Vajian. What do you think? Yeah. And that Buddha doesn't want to look at him and that Buddha just talked to Ananda. And yeah. tell another this budget. I, I guess the Buddha probably in his heart he doesn't like this man. He never liked to talk to him. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, no, nope. not necessarily. No. Well, I, I kind of agree with a little bit with what she's saying, but I wouldn't say it's not that he he, he doesn't want it in his heart. He doesn't like him. It's more as though he sees through his fakery. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because you, you know, sometimes even we can see through someone's fakery in that way. And, and I think that's why he starts off with the words of fi finding it intrusive. Okay, there are some good ideas here. I, as I said, I don't have a definite answer to this. Bhante, actually, uh, it's very difficult to fathom the background of the words of the Buddha, because Buddha, as perhaps I had heard you in one of your lectures, that he had the marvelous quality of knowing the minds of the people. Right. And right. he could perhaps see through the, the actual background of the words uttered to him by this man. So yeah. he, was, uh, he was actually trying to teach him further, perhaps in these a uh, little bit harsh words that yeah. you should stop it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Could it, could it, yeah. Could okay. it be that that these uh, qualifiers, intrusive and prying, are later insertions? 
That we don't know. That we don't know. But apparently there's, in any case, there's something either in the words themselves that were spoken or in the attitude with which the words are spoken that induced either the Buddha himself or the compilers of the texts to use those rather strong words to characterize the statement of the Brahman Vasakara. But in any case, I want to move on now because I want to take another sutta. And so we're going to move on now to sutta number 36, which is a very interesting sutta. And so this is called the Dona Sutta, and the protagonist of this sutta is a Brahmin named Dona. And the Brahmin Dona is going to play a quite important role in the later on in the life of the Buddha, or actually after the Buddha passes away. Since after the Buddha passed away, when his body was cremated, the princes and kings and representatives from the different kingdoms and states of northern India came to the site of the cremation and all of them were making claims to acquire to take possession of the bodily remains of the buddha after the cremation to take possession of the sarira the bodily remains of the buddha and then it was the Brahmin Dona who was present in that assembly, and he speaks up and he says that our master, the Buddha, was a man of peace. Uh, yeah, the, the kings and the princes were ready to start going to war with each other to get possession of the Buddha's bodily remains. And then the Brahmin Dona speaks up and says that our teacher, the Buddha, was a man who always preached peace harmony and nonviolence, so let's not fight over his relics, but instead we can divide the relics up into portions, and each of you can take a portion of the relics. So that's the role that the Brahmin Dona plays later, at the, after the Buddha passes away. But this is the story of his first encounter with the Buddha. So one time, Apparently, the Buddha here is traveling alone along this highway between Ukatta and Setavya. And when the Buddha is traveling alone, generally this indicates that he is seen in advance using his supernormal vision. He's seen that there is a particular person who is to be instructed and guided and led into the Dharma. And yet, if the Buddha were to be traveling with a great company of monks, he would not be able to connect person to person with that, with that potential disciple. So in that case, the Buddha will leave the community and sort of set off on his own. He'll set off on his own and await the opportunity to encounter the potential disciple. So in this case, the Buddha is traveling along that highway and traveling along the same highway that comes the Brahman Dona. And as the Brahman is traveling, he sees along the road the footprints, the Buddha's footprints, which are said to have wheels with a thousand spokes, with their rims and hubs complete in all respects. Now these, are, this, these marks are one of the 32 marks of a great man possessed by the Buddha. And it's said that the Buddha doesn't always display them when he's walking. But in this case, the Buddha had formed, this is according to the commentary, the Buddha had formed the intention, the resolution in his mind that the Brahman will, that he will leave those footprints in the soil of the road and that the Brahman will see them as he's following along that road. 
And so in this way, it would arouse the interest and even the puzzle, the puzzlement, the perplexity of the Brahmin, which will lead him into the presence of the Buddha. So what is the significance? Why does the Buddha have these footprints or these, this mark of a thousand spoked wheels on the soles of his feet? This is explained in a sutta in the Dika Nikaya called the Lakana Sutta. which explains the significance of the 32 special characteristics of the Buddha's body. And in this case, it said, so I'm reading now from the translation by Mr. Walsh, in whatever form of life, the Tathagata, the Buddha, was born as a human being. He lived for the happiness of many people, he dispelled fear and terror, and he provided them with lawful protection and shelter, and he, supply, <laughs> he supplied them with all their necessities. And so as a result of that karma, he was reborn in a happy state in a heavenly world, and then falling away from there, from the heavenly world, and coming back to rebirth as a human being, he acquired this mark of the great man, that is, on the soles of his feet, there were these wheels with a thousand spokes, complete in all respects, with their rims and their hubs. So those wheels were sort of the comic result of the Buddha's living for the welfare and happiness of many people in the past, dispelling their fear and terror and giving them lawful shelter and protection. So when the Buddha was practicing the Bodhisattva path, he acquired these merits through his actions that came to fruition in one way through this characteristic of a great man, the wheels, the thousand spoke wheels on the feet. And now the Brahmins are trained to recognize certain supernormal features of the bodies, the characteristics of the bodies. And so this Brahmin, when he saw those the footprints with the thousand, the wheels, the thousand spoke wheels, he thought, this is wonderful, this is amazing. These can't be the footprints of a human being. And so the Buddha is walking ahead, and probably at this point he knows, again through his supernormal vision, that the Brahmin has discovered, has perceived his footprints. And so the Buddha then leaves the highway, and he sits down at the foot of a tree, he crosses his legs, he sets up mindfulness, and he enters into a meditative absorption. And then the Brahmin traces the Buddha's footprints, follows them. He wants to see what kind of supernormal being, supernatural being has left these footprints. Maybe it's a deity. Maybe it's Indra or Brahma himself. He follows the footprints and then he sees the Buddha sitting at the foot of the tree. And then the text gives us a very beautiful description of the Buddha as he's sitting there. So it describes the Buddha as Pasadikang, Pasadaniyang, Santindriyang, Santamanasang, Uttama Dhammata Samatam, Anupattang, Dantang Gutang, Sangyat Indriyang, Nagang. So first it calls him a Naga. A Naga is a bull elephant. And maybe from our, at least for us Westerners, Americans, to call somebody an elephant might be a term of insult. But against the 
ancient Indian background to call somebody a Naga, it's a term of praise. Of course, the Naga gives the suggestion of something which is majestic, dignified, powerful. So the Buddha is called a Naga, in that Naga is described as Nagaya excellent. Okay, so the Naga is described as Pasadikang. And if you remember last time, we spoke about Pasada as confidence or trust. So Pasadika is that which inspires confidence and trust. Pasadaniyang, almost the same in meaning that which inspires, which causes the mind to become tranquil and peaceful out of its confidence and trust. It's sant indriyam, that is the sense faculties are peaceful and calm. Santa manasang, the mind is calm. He possesses, one who has possessed supreme training, taming and tranquility who is tamed, guarded in the sense faculties, with restrained sense faculties. So it's a, quite a beautiful, in Pali, quite a beautiful description of the Buddha. As he's sitting there, absorbed in meditation, So then the Brahman comes to the Buddha. He comes up to him. And then he asks a, a series of questions. And the questions depend upon a particular, the question and answers depend upon a word play, a word play that involves the use of the future tense in Pali. So this is a matter of grammar, of Pali grammar. I have to keep on jumping back and forth. So the decisive word here is the future tense of the verb meaning to be in Pali. The word is bavisati. So literally, this will mean will be. But the future tense has at least two uses in Pali. And I'm reading here from the Pali grammar on explaining the use of the future. So of course, the main use of the future, future tense, is to make a statement about something that will take place in the future at a later time. But another use of the future is to express what must be or what must not be, what can be or cannot be. And so when the Brahmin uses the future tense, he's using it in the second sense it's a kind of polite way of asking, are you a deva? Are you a deity? But the Buddha is using the, fu the future tense in the more literal sense of what pertains to the future, particularly in this case, what pertains to the next life. So I tried in the translation to capture this by using two different translations though the Pali uses the future tense in both the question and the answer. And so the Brahman says, Devo 
no bhavang bhavisati. So, are you, sir? Uh, could you be, sir, a deity? And the Buddha says, n, which means not ahang, I, devo, a deity, bhavisami, I will not be a deva. And then the Brahman asks again, we go through different types of beings. Of course, the Brahman can't believe that the Buddha is a human being because he's so serene, majestic, glorious in his presence. So could you be a Gandhava, a Gandharva? The Gandharvas are the celestial musicians. Could you be a Gandharva? And the Buddha says, using the future in the literal sense, I will not be a Gandhava. Could you be a Yaksha? The Yaksha of fierce spirits. The Buddha says, I will not be, literally speaking, I will not be, I will not become a Yaksha. And then the fourth question can be puzzling. Could you be a human being? And of course, the Buddha is a human being, but since the Brahman is using the future tense to express possibility, could you be? The Buddha takes the future sense literally and says, or the Buddha uses the future tense literally and says, I will not be a human being. And so the Buddha has apparently rejected the way the Buddha understood, the way the Brahman understands this, the Buddha has de denied being a deity, a Gandharva, a Yaksha, or a human being. So the Brahman is completely puzzled and says, how is this possible for you to reject these four possibilities? And then the Buddha gives his answer. He says, I have a that there are certain taints, again, the word is asavas, because of which a person might be reborn as a deva, might become a deva. But I have abandoned those taints, mm -hmm. cut them off at the root, made them like palm stumps, obliterated them. <laughs> and so for that reason, because I've eradicated the taints that lead to rebirth as a deva, I will not be in the future a deva. And similarly, there are certain taints that will lead to rebirth as a Gandharva, those I have eradicated. Certain taints that lead to rebirth as a yaksha, those I have eradicated. And then certain taints that will lead back to rebirth as a human being. Those taints I have eradicated, cut off at the root, made like a palm stump, obliterated them so that they are no longer subject to future arising. And then the Buddha sort of sums up his answer with a beautiful simile. He says that it's just like a blue, red, or white lotus flower. It's born in the water, it grows up in the water, but then it rises above the water and stands unsoiled by the water, untainted by the water. Even so, I have been born in the world and I've grown up in the world, but I have overcome the world and I dwell in the world untainted by the world. And so, he says, remember me, Brahman, as a Buddha. And then he restates the point again in verse, or maybe it's the compilers of the canon who have restated the point in verse. Yeah, so the verse is actually expressed explicitly in terms of rebirth using the word upapati, which means a rebirth. 
So those taints by which I might have been reborn as a deva or as a gandaba that travels through the sky, those taints I have destroyed. And those taints by which I might have reached the state of a yaka, a fierce spirit, or those taints that might have led me back to the human state, those taints I have dispelled and cut off at the root. And so just as a lovely white lotus is not soiled by the water, so I am not soiled or tainted by the world. Therefore, O Brahman, I am a Buddha. Okay, so that will be our discussion of the sutta. And now we can take some questions either on this sutta or on the previous sutta. And if you have any questions, the way to ask the question is to raise your hand. And the way you raise your hand, I think you'll see in your screen, you'll see the icon of a hand. And what you do is to click that hand symbol, and then you'll appear on my participant list. And then I'll click on you to ask your question. And so I see the first one is Olivia, and I unmute you. Hmm. It's not working. Can you unmute yourself? Okay. Have, okay. Uh, good morning, Big Bodhi. Mm -hmm. I. Uh, have a question on the first uh, sutta that you covered. Okay. And I think I heard you say that um, in regards to the four qualities and specifically when we reach the fourth quality, um, that some arahants do not attain the four jhanas or do not need to attain the four yeah. jhana. Yeah, right. And my question is, it, it's just that I am of the assumption that the progression through the four jhanas are, um, is a gradual undoing of mental fabrications. So why is it that uh, they do not need to attain the four jhanas? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Yeah, and this is according to the position which sort of emerges, or at least it's made explicit in the commentaries, that there are different types of arhats which are di distinguished by their approach to the attainment of samadhi or their application to samadhi. So there are arhats who attain all four jhanas that could be, and then use the four jhanas as their springboard for developing insight in order to attain arhatship. And then there are some arhats who might attain only the first jhana or just two jhanas or three jhanas in or, as the basis for attaining arhatship. But the commentaries say also that there is a type of arhat, they call them, um, technically it's called the dry insight arhat. The Pali word is sukha vipassaka. because it said that the jhanas sort of have the function of moistening the mind. And so those who achieve arhatship without developing the jhanas have a dry insight. So these practitioners don't develop the jhanas, but they move directly into the development of the four foundations of mindfulness and especially going for the contemplation of the arising and passing away of the five aggregates. And then by insight into the rise and fall of the aggregates, they're able to gain the insight knowledges and then thereby to eradicate the defilements and attain our hardship. Yeah, so they go directly into the practice of insight meditation without developing the jhanas as a basis for insight. 
Thank you, Bika Bodhi. Okay. Um, okay, let's take Paul. Yes, Bika Bodhi, G O H. Bante, I have two questions. The first question re regarding the um, arahanship. Um, as a lay person, so is if it, what I heard was that if a lay person become an arahan, say in this life, and that if he, if he or she does not become a mangaran, he would die within seven days. Was it anywhere that you you may have come across in the suttas? That was my first question. The okay, Let, let's question, take let's take each one question at a time. Okay, I haven't come across that statement in the suttas. But there is no account in the suttas of a lay person attaining arahatship and then continuing to live on as a lay person. Um, there are some accounts in the suttas of a lay person attaining arahatship, but they attain arahatship and then they pass away very soon. It's sort of the, they attain arahatship on the verge of death. Okay. Right. Yeah, I think so, that statement first comes in the Melinda Panha, and then it's from there it's absorbed into the commentaries. Okay, second question. Second question is regarding the blue lotus, because I, I, I read some suttas, they always refer to this blue lotus. Uh, as we know that in this world, there are no blue lotus. Could that be the water lily? Yeah, it's actually also called the water lily. I've, I've, I've looked into this and I've seen it described in both ways as a blue lotus and as a blue water lily. Okay, right, thank you. That's all I have, right, thank okay. you. Okay, next is Vaitri. Uh, good morning, Bhante, thank good you. Morning. My question is for regarding the first sutta and the third quality, um, which is obtaining the higher mind, the four jhanas. The Pali word used here is abhichetasika. Is that right. synonymous with adhichitta? Yeah, it's an adjective based on adhichitta. Adhichitta is the noun, and for some reason the prefix changes and becomes abhichetasika. Yeah. Thank you, Bhante. Okay, next, Cynthia. Yes, hi. Hi. How are you? Okay. I have a question. I'm a new person joining your, um, your groups, and um, I have a question. Um, as a human, um, do we have to live through certain um, lessons before we die in order to decide whether or not we would like to come back um, here to Earth? <laughs> I know it's kind of, uh, kind of um, yeah. Uh, the reason why I ask is because um, my daughter yeah. took her life oh, five I, years ago yeah and um i know she didn't learn all of her lessons yeah. yeah yeah first we don't have a really a choice about coming back until one attains our hardship one has to come back um but it seems to me this is my personal opinion that if yeah. one gets into a difficult situation and one tries to escape it by committing suicide, one is not going to escape, but eventually one is going to come back into a very similar situation. And I think at some point one has to be, learn to resolve that situation in a reasonable way, not by taking the escape route of suicide. That's my personal opinion in regard to that. So defining happiness in one's life yeah um it can be difficult but how does one attain that uh, you know life can throw some horrible things at you how do you let that flow off of you yeah of course and, it opens up a whole very very big yeah. subject um yeah. but basically we have to <laughs> the, probably the main quality that one has to has to develop and to you know, to acquire and develop is patience and equanimity, so, and to recognize that life involves suffering. That is what the Buddha announces in the first noble truth. 
So we are right. always expecting things to go according to our desires. And so one has to be able to recognize that often things are going to go contrary to our desires. Sometimes we're going to be pushed into very difficult corners. And we have to accept these difficulties with patience, with equanimity, and try to manage the best we can in the face of the difficulties, not to run away from them. And I wonder how that will affect me as her mother, because I'm dealing with sadness. Yeah, inevitably it's, there's going to be sadness because of that. Um, there's no... Yeah, so one of the kind of reflections that we use is to recognize that everybody has their own destiny. And what one could do is, of course this requires a certain amount of faith, is to do good, wholesome deeds in memory of your daughter. And then as a kind of contemplation, even just for a few minutes before going to bed, recall those good deeds and dedicate those good deeds to your daughter. Sort of call her to mind as if she's sort of floating around watching you and call, even call her name and say, I've done these good deeds on your behalf. Please recognize this and rejoice in, in them. And perhaps it's possible that she that. will be able to sort of tune in and in that way, that will alleviate her burden to some extent. Okay, I'm going to have to take maybe. Oh, that's good. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, yeah, do that, try that. Every day, do, do something like that, or at least once a week. I will, I will, well, I will start that today. Thank yeah. you. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Leo Li Hui. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for sharing. Um, actually, my question is from uh, the Sutta on Dona. Um, just now you mentioned that the Buddha has uh, the footprints because of. Karma. Well, I'm having difficulty so, hearing. Let me just yeah, so just now you. Okay. Um, can you hear? Okay, now it's better. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, just now you mentioned that the footprints that the Buddha had was due to the karmic prints of his path. Uh, his bodhisattva path. Yeah. So actually, I, I'm quite curious. Uh, what is the Theravadan's take on the bodhisattva path? Because I always thought that it was a uh, a Mahayana like um like concept. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. okay. Yeah. So, thank you so, so much. So you think that the bodhisattva path is exclusively a Mahayana concept, and you're asking, what is the Theravada? Yeah. Actually, that yes, yeah. yeah. How do I like you know? Um, yeah, I think that's a common misunderstanding. Um, yes. Okay, the teaching in the suttas, in the nikayas, at least the four main nikayas, always emphasizes our hardship as the final goal. But the Buddha himself, we know, followed the path of the bodhisattva. So in the Pali commentaries, we find emerging the in a the recognition of a bodhisattva path and then the description of the bodhisattva path. Of course, I don't have the time to be able to do this right now, mm -hmm. but if you go to Google, because I translated this track on the bodhisattva path in the Pali mm -hmm. commentaries, mm -hmm. you search, it's called a treatise on the paramis. If you search for that, you'll find it. It's about a 70 page booklet that describes the practice of the paramitas from the Theravada mm. point of view. Mm. Okay, so we take pra maha chan. Thank you so much, Pandi. Thank okay. you so much, Pikupati. Thank you. Pra maha. We have to unmute. Can you unmute yourself? Can you hear me? Okay, now I hear. Okay. Okay, I'm from Thailand. Yeah. I have one question about language. Like, uh, 
uh, uh, what is the proper English uh, that we translate as the word? What is a good word? Yeah, there's no real, <coughs> no real good word for Asava, but some translators <coughs> use outflow, some use inflow, some use, Venerable Yanamoli use taint, which I have used here in the other. Taint, yeah. But there's no real, uh -huh. some have used pollutant, contaminant, there are many different translations. Right. None of them are. You know. And uh, another question: uh, <laughs> What you use uh, for the word asavakaya? Yana? Asavakaya. Yeah, that would be the knowledge of the destruction of the asavas. Uh -huh. Yeah, and then you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we could take one more question, and we could take Diani or Diani. Uh, yes, Bante, good morning. Good morning. So, is it yeah. Diani or Diani? It's Diani, Bante. Diani, okay. Yes. Um, related to the question by Olivia just now about uh, some Arahans achieve the Arahanship without uh, attain Jhana, yeah. but by Vipassana. And you were saying something like uh, they call it some sort like what's dry, dry. Can you repeat that word, uh, yeah, Bante? It's, yeah, it's called dry, like something dried in the sun. Dry, yeah, yeah. dry insight. Oh, dry insight. Yeah. So, not, uh, am I right by saying that the prerequisite for arahantship is actually uh, insight meditation or vipassana? Right, that's right, yeah. Okay, that's all, Bante. Thank you very much. Vipassana. Okay, since that was a short one, we could fit in one more question. We'll take Ravisara. Uh, yes, thank you, Bhante. Bhante, it's about this uh, dry vipassana thing you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, I've heard that uh, uh, in earliest Buddhist texts, uh, this was not mentioned, and it's, an, it's a later addition, this uh, dry vipassana method. Is that correct, Bhante? The expression dry insight is a later, a, a later term. I'm not sure that the concept of, a, of arhats who achieve arhatship without relying on the jhanas is necessarily a later, a later idea. Of course, sometimes in the suttas we see monks come to the Buddha and say, please, Bhante, teach me the Dhamma in brief so I could go off to practice on my own. And then the Buddha will give them some instructions simply on insight, and then they go off and then they practice, and then the text says that they achieved our hardship. Okay, thank you. Vincent. Okay, so at this point, I'm sorry, I won't be able to take the other questions because we have to go up for the lunch now. So let us end for the day by doing the verses for sharing the merits. Okay, so let us share the merits with the devas, the nagas, the bhutas, or yakshas, and then with all other beings. Okay. I'll open the chat box. Actually, it won't last. Okay. Those who have questions, maybe can write them down and send them to me through the contact BAUS website, the website of BAUS, if it's important questions. Akasa ta 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 ta
Deva Naga Mahidika Punyantung Anumoditva Chirang Rakantumang Karang E Tavatacham Hehi Sampadang Punya Sampadang Sabe Deva Anumodantu Sabha Sampati Sidya E Tavatacham Hehi Sampadang Punya Sampadang Sabe Bhuta Anumodantu Sabha Sampati Sidya E Tavatacham Hehi Sampadang Punya Sampadang Sabe Sata Anumodantu Sabha Sampati Sidya Bhavagupadaya vichi hate to e tantare satakayu papanna rupia rupicha sanya sanino dukha pamuchantu pusantu nibuting Everybody can say Sadhu. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank Okay, okay, people. Bye, Sandra. Thank you, everyone. Wonderful seeing you, Bante. Thank you so much. Oh, okay, I'm going to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. It's so nice to see you. Okay. We love you, Bante. We love you, Bante. Love you, Bante. Thank you, Bante G. Thank you, Bante. Okay, we'll go on. Thank you. Oh, I see. This is Tohila. Yes. Hello. California. Okay. How are you, Fantiji? Okay, okay. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to end the call now. Okay, thank you.